Neil Young likes to take his listeners on journeys, and like he does in his own life, he likes to keep going forward. He's never going to tread water. He's never going to. He's never going to stop. He's had more wins than most artists have in one career. You know, most artists don't have a second wind. He's had three wins. He has an enormous number of great peaks, and he maintained his vitality so far for close to 40 years. Following the muted reception to Zuma in January 1976, Young traveled to Miami to record an album of material with Stephen Stills. In April, the pair were to embark on a tour, but Young walked after only 18 shows and returned home to work on material for a new album. Released the following year, American Stars and Bars was viewed as a disappointment. Originally to be released as the album Chrome Dreams, two months before it eventually emerged, Young recorded a set of country songs for the first side, and the finished work was criticized for being uneven. You've got the one side, which is kind of rocky, and the other side, which is very, very country. I mean, it's, it's almost straight country, the, the style of it. It's more country than Harvest, that album. And I think that rankled a lot of people, too, because it was, Harvest was the hippie country. It was the back-to-the-land country. American Stars and Bars, just like Old Ways later on, is pure country. And the long hairs could accept country influences and folk influences. They weren't quite ready yet to embrace straight country. With American Stars and the Bars, he really lost his way, by which I mean it so happens that we have two completely alternate versions of the album, the so-called Chrome Dreams tapes of which there are two separate versions, two completely different versions of that particular album that was ready to go at the end of 76 and that he scrapped. Uh, the 10-track version of that album is as good, in my opinion, as On the Beach. Um, you know, and it has certain key material on it um, which actually doesn't end up being used until much, much later, ironically, on things like freedom and ragged glory um, but you have uh, songs like string man uh, one of his great songs that was that was effectively discarded after being um, I think it was debuted at the uh, Hammersmith shows in 76 certainly which were amazing performances and I'm singing for the string Then we get the Neil the Tampera, and, and this is really the first point in which it starts to become a problem. Uh, ironically, much like Dylan, uh, the same time period, you know, uh, Dylan's, the point at which Dylan's tampering with his album starts to become a problem is round about the time of Desire, the end of 75. Um, same thing with Neil, he starts to twiddle with the thing. He starts to, well, maybe I should rework it. I mean, as I say, we actually have two different versions of Chrome Dreams. Even that bloody thing he couldn't leave alone. You know, and there's all these alternative sequences, and, and you start to get a sense he's lost the plot slightly in terms of what, what it was ever about. Um, and in Neil's case, I think he fell into the trap of trying to make profound statement rather than saying done dusted put it out I'll make another record next year despite the criticisms one song emerged as an undisputed heavyweight in Young's canon like a hurricane if ever there's an album that's made by one track it's American Stars and Bars because it's lifted by Hurricane which of course goes down as one of the great Neil Young guitar epics. He can come up with a, like a hurricane and that's absolutely brilliant because he can do that. He is so prolific. He is always writing, he's always recording, you know, and it's an odds game. I mean, not every song is going to be a, like a hurricane. Not every song is going to be brilliant. So you record it, you shelve it, maybe you'll use some of it, pull it out later, which he's done. I mean, he's recycled ideas from other songs as well. But, I mean, he's the kind of guy that you always want to gamble on because, there, because there's going to be a like a hurricane coming down the pike someday soon again whether it's this album or the next album there's always that gem that he's always going to come up with from somewhere it's almost impossible to talk in terms of 
him getting better or, or progressing. Or it, it is what it is. It's a fantastic sound. Uh, he hit on that sound very early on with Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere, and he was still doing it on Hurricane, and he's still doing it, certainly in concert, to this day. Young's next album would see him return to Nashville, and both his country and folk roots. Comes a Time, released in late 1978, benefited from vocal duets with the late country star Nicolette Larson, and the album would be Young's first US Top 20 since Harvest. Comes a Time is a lovely album. I mean, after he'd made Harvest, you know, he backed away from repeating that, and I suppose you can say that he, he, he moved some way in that direction uh, on Comes a Time. Um, but he was so determined not to make Harvest Mark II, uh, that, that, uh, that was a constraint on him in some ways. Um, but the simplicity of it, the, 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 the return to basics, if you like, make for a, a quite compelling record. Comes a time when you're drifting, comes a time when you settle Comes a Time always is sort of positioned as a sequel to Harvest, but in many ways it, it's, it's much different because whereas Harvest, part of it was recorded in California, part of it was recorded in Nashville, Comes a Time is, is truly a, like a Nashville production as it were, and much more produced than Harvest because it just, there are, there are violins happening, you know, the overdubs are, you know, a little more pronounced and it doesn't quite have that, I don't know, the, the folky elements of, of Harvest that seemed a little more real. That said, you have a song like Motorcycle Mama, <laughs> Look Out For My Love, which are you know, a little edgier and frankly sort of outside the, um, the groove of Comes the Time. But those are examples of how Neil would drop certain tracks into the flow just to sort of jar the listener out of the, um, the flow of the record as it, as it was put together. But then again, he'll, he'll hark back to a song like Four Strong Winds, which was one of his favorite songs as a young boy growing up. And that he would put that on a record at this point in his career is interesting because he was looking back at a song that meant so much to him as a young boy, but was also looking ahead to winds that he maybe had no idea what, you know, where they were going to take him. I think, again, he was looking at that somewhat metaphorically for the point he was at his musical career. Like after the Gold Rush, it's a record where the melodies just keep on coming, the tunes just keep on coming. But they're straighter than the tunes on After a Gold Rush. They are. Uh, uh, there are because the 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 basic mood is a is a bunch of love songs. Um, uh, they're not quite as um, reflective. They don't have that, uh, that that quality of depth that the tunes on on After the Gold Rush seem come to seem to have uh, if you've listened to the record a few times. Well, Comes in Time certainly feels like a folk album on the surface, but you know if you think about one of the tracks that didn't make the record, and that track. Um, was a version of uh, Hank Lachlan's uh, number one country single from 1960, Please Help Me, I'm Falling. Uh, that's a real dyed-in-the-wool country choice, um, as much as Old Lonesome Me. And uh, it would have been interesting to have that on the album and, and to see how it might have shifted the balance. But, um, you know, a song like Field of Opportunity, you know, where he sings it's plowing time again, very rural in orientation. Um, sure, it's folky, but um, but the banjo is, is, is pretty twangy, so uh, it's it's a... It's a nice mix, uh, kind of a fusion, I think, of, of folk and country at a very uh, noisy time in, in pop music. <laughs> the noise that was creating the biggest rift in popular music was punk. From the Ramones in the US to the Sex Pistols in the UK, disenfranchised youth had a new voice. Aiming to create a musical year zero and targeting the pretensions and excesses of the old guard, the punk attitude was abrasive and determined. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Young wisely decided to publicly praise the movement. He also befriended the new wave band Devo, finding a common link between his recent artistic methods and the punk ethos. 
Young's next album, Rust Never Sleeps, was born out of an impromptu jam with Devo and contained a reference to Johnny Rotten. Some rock critics were quick to promote Young's affinity with this new musical movement, whereas others saw his professed interest as a desperate measure.